الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام سيدنا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه أجمعين ومن استنى بسنتي بإحسان إلى يوم الدين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته like to welcome you all to another session from the Arba'in or Imanovi the commentary of this course and inshallah we are going to be looking at hadith number 13 loving your Muslim brother in the next few moments. And we mentioned from the last hadith that this is actually one of the hadith or a hadith which is very important in terms of the realm of mannerisms, the four, one of the four hadith which are uh, the basis for the foundations of mannerism in Islam. But this is a very important hadith. And so now let's go to the recitation of the, this hadith. عن أبي حمزة أنس بن مالك رضي عنه خادمي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أنا النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه رواه البخاري ومسلم أنس بن مالك also known as Abu Hamza who was a servant خادم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم reported the Prophet صلى said none of you truly believes until he loves for his brother that which he loves for himself and this is reported in the Sahihain now, as is our tradition, we're going to go into the life of the narrator of this hadith, which is none other than Abu Hamza Anas bin Malik. And again, the title of this great person, this great Sahabi by Imam Nawawi was Khadam Rasulullah. He was a servant of Rasulullah, the Messenger of Allah. This is a great noble characteristic and qualification of Anas bin Malik. So his kunya is Abu Hamza. And he is number three among the top narrators of hadith among the Sahaba. He narrated approximately 2,286 ahadith. Anas said, when Allah's Prophet وسلم, arrived in Medina, Abu Talha, this was his stepdad, took hold of my hand and brought me to Allah's Prophet وسلم, and said, O oh Allah's Prophet, وسلم, Anas is an intelligent boy. So let him serve you. Anas added, So I served the Messenger of Allah, Prophet Sallallahu at home and on journeys. And by Allah, he never said to me anything which I did. Why have you done this like this? Or for anything which I did not do, why have you not done this like this? Nari and Al-Bukhari. And this again, just confirms the beautiful character of the Prophet Sallallahu as the most patient this is a beautiful characteristic of the Prophet ﷺ, which we learn through the Sahaba, the best students of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So, furthermore, Al Ansari narrated from his father that Anas Radhaan used to pray till his feet would swell or bleed due to his prolonged standing in the salah. Thabit Al Banani said that Abu Huray Radhaan said, I have never seen anyone whose prayer resembles the prayer of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is Abu Huraira. He basically literally was at every footstep of the Prophet ﷺ for the few years which he spent with him, being the people of Sufa. I have never seen anyone whose prayer resembles the prayer of the Prophet ﷺ in length and beauty, except that of Ibn Umm Sulaym, i.e. Anas bin Malik. And remember, Umm Sulaym was another Sahabiya who was very righteous and of course this was basically the mother of Anas bin Malik and she gave her son to serve the Messenger of Allah. Look at the beautiful generosity and the submission of the Ansar, the service of the Prophet and the Muhajirun, subhanAllah. Anas bin Malik, he, he died in the year of 93 after Hijri at approximately 103 years of age. Okay. The Prophet ﷺ prayed for increase in 
the wealth and the churn of Anas. Okay. And also in his age, I believe. And so when he died, he had seen 120 sons and sons of his sons, Ya'ni, male grandchildren. And he was one of the richest of the Ansar. Look at the fadl that the Sahabi, you know, gains. This is just worldly things, but just from the service, being a servant to being one of the richest of the people of the Ansar. And again, it's not incorrect to say that many of the Sahaba became millionaires near the end of their life. And this is just one token that they get from committing their lives to service of the deen and the Prophet So now transitioning to this beautiful hadith, the muqaddimah of this hadith, where this hadith states that لَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَحَدُكُمْ حَتَّى يُحِبَّ لِيَخِيهِ مَا يُحِبُّ لِنَفْسِي None of you truly believes until he loves for his brother that which he loves for himself. A beautiful precedent which is being placed here in this hadith where it states that the Muslim should love for other Muslims that which he loves for himself. And so this lays down a significant important principle for the behavior of Muslims toward each other. Okay. Now, one thing it's very important to note as we're looking at the translation, it may perhaps scare us to note that this Iman from this hadith is not a pillar of Iman, but an important component of it. So when one applies this hadith, this is a reflection that he has perfected Iman. If someone is not able to fulfill this hadith to love another Muslim as you love yourself, it does not mean that you have not believed. No, it just means that you have not perfected your Iman. But we should try as much as possible because the Prophet has has been so emphatic in stating that none of you truly believes. So this is almost as he is emphasizing that it is needed without saying it is needed. So you have to understand that this is an important translation of this hadith because this may also give the wrong notion and definition from this hadith. Because literally we may incorrectly state that no one believes the one who doesn't treat the other brother as he would treat himself. But we should try, of course, as this hadith greatly encourages us to do so. So application of this hadith leads to ihsan. Again, all these are building blocks. They're enhancing and beautifying that house of Islam. So a true Islamic community is built upon love and compassion between its members, which this hadith promotes. Loving that which is good for others is also part of loving them. They should treat others in the same way that they wish to be treated. Okay. The Prophet وسلم, also says in a similar hadith, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِي لَا يُؤْمِنُوا عَبْدٌ حَتَّى يُحِبَّ لِيَخِيهِ مَا يُحِبُّ لِنَفْسِهِ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ The servant does not truly believe until he loves for others that which he loves for himself from the khayr, the good. And this is narrated by Anas bin Malik in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad and greater as Sahih as well. The Prophet furthermore says in another hadith, فَمَنْ أَحَبَّ أَيْ يُزَحْزَحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَيَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَلْتَأْتِهِ مَنِيَّتُهُ وَهُوَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَالْيَأْتِ إِلَى النَّاسِ الَّذِي يُحِبُّ أَنْ يُؤْتَ إِلَيْهِ Hadith narrated in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet says, Whoever wishes to be delivered from the fire and enter the garden should die with faith in Allah. And the last day should treat the people as he wishes to be treated by them. And this is again now treating the people, an-nas, yani anyone, Muslim or ghair Muslim. So this is also important precedent in terms of our manners to others as well who are not Muslim because we want to save them for the fire. And want to also treat them in the best way and what can be best and more better than giving them the hidayah and the salvation from internal damnation. So a true Islamic community can only arise when the barriers to brotherhood are removed. And these can come from divisions such as race, ethnicity, color, economic class. And it could also arise from extreme affiliations to, to different madhahib or religious groups and circles. Remember, shaitan, he wants to divide us and make something which is a potentially 
something good into something bad. They're all different colors and shades and backgrounds, and but shaitan wants to inject us with things which will divide us. These are just ways that we can recognize each other and get to know ourselves better, but this can, Hitan wants to make this a negative. So other barriers can contribute to division between Muslims or also jealousy, pride, selfishness, hatred, and envy. These are evils of the heart. So when we deal with other Muslims in the community, we need to deal with them in the best way and also discard all these evils and not look at our brother through shades in terms of economics or in terms of race, in terms of language, and logha. These are just, uh, this all. every Muslim is precious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone who says, La ilaha illallah, uh, they have a great honor with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So furthermore, also, we should, in terms of brotherhood, we need to choose the best words in our conversations. Okay. Good words minimize disputes and confrontations between each other. The Quran says in Surah Ahzab, Ayah 70, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullaha wa koolu kawlan sadeeda. O you who believe, keep your duty to Allah and fear Him and speak always the right word. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Isra, وَقُلِّ عِبَادِي يَقُولُ الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَنْزَغُ بَيْنَهُمْ إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ كَانَ لِلْإِنسَانِ عَدُوًا مُبِينًا And tell my servants that they should always say those words that are best. Verily, shaytan sows a state of conflict and disagreement among them. So from this hadith, mercy and compassion should exist in our dealings with others. And this is related to al-wala, which was discussed in hadith number 7. Two of the four aspects of al-wala come from this hadith. That are that Muslims must care about one another. And the other two which are not mentioned in this hadith and others are that to defend and help Muslims. And this is going to also come in future hadith, inshallah, from this great collection. Kibr, the evil of arrogance. Okay. One important behavior that we should be very wary of is kibr or arrogance. Arrogance can come in many forms, which can include belittling others, looking down at others. Again, as we mentioned, through deeming that you know one's race is inferior or one's economic background makes them less honorable in the sight of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. You know, this is just evil in the heart. We can never have arrogance because this is the evil of shaitan. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna akramakum in the Allahi atqaakum. The one who is most noble to Allah is the one who has the most taqwa. Okay. So we can never look at oneself as better, even if we are doing great deeds and have great knowledge, because we don't know what's going to be the end, or whether that other person indeed may be even higher. Because they may have a better heart, they may have a better iman, yet we may not see their good deeds. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال ذرة من الكبر. قال رجل إن الرجل يحب أن يكون ثوبه حسنا ونعله حسنا. قال إن الله جميل يحب الجمال الكبر بطر الحق وغمت الناس. The Prophet ﷺ said. He who has in his heart the weight of a mustard seed of pride shall not enter paradise. لا يدخل الجنة A mustard seed. Um, you could barely even visualize the speck of a mustard seed. Subhanallah. May Allah guide us and protect us from kibr. And then a person from among the listeners said, Verily a person loves that his dress should be fine and his shoes should be fine. The Prophet ﷺ said, That verily, Allahu Jamal, Yuhibbul Jamal. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful and He loves beauty. And He said, Al-Kibru Batru Al-Haq. Pride is disdaining and you know disliking the truth because of conceit and and also having contempt and hatred to people. This is what an arrogant person is. He hates people. He hates goodness. It's a horrible quality to have. May Allah protect us from kibr. Ameen. 
So altogether, we need to be humble and show mercy to others. Part of loving good things for others is to practice mutual consultation and enjoin goodness and forbidding evil. Okay. When we advise others, we should do it in a good way based on our love for them and not to seek personal interest. And it's unfortunate that arrogance is rampant among the Muslim lands in the form of racism, ethnic pride, or economic differences. Okay. We need to be humble and show mercy to others. This is what this beautiful hadith is teaching us. The Prophet also used to show his love for others when giving advice to them. So when advising others, it's better to also explicitly mention that we advise them because we love and care for them as our brethren. Okay. Because sometimes, again, with the person who we're advising, they can have sensitivities. Shaitan can inject evil notions in their heart. Who does this person think he is? He's advising me. You know, He thinks that he's better than me. No. The person wants you to be guided and protected from evil, protected from the hellfire. That's the ultimate goal of your fellow brother who is trying to advise you for the betterment. Okay. So if an advice is specific for an individual, it should be done, of course, in private so as to not offend the person. So we have to also make sure that the other etiquettes are in place while we're doing nasiha and protecting the person's honor also is very important as well. So wishing the best for your brother. Fudayl ibn Iyad went one step further when putting this hadith into practice. You know, he was a famous ascetic who actually had been an infamous thief but mended his ways with tawbah and just really exceeded. He basically became one of the stars in the ummah. He said that we should wish others to be like us. But we should also wish them to be better than us. SubhanAllah. And this is from the bounty of Islam, bounty of generosity, and the wisdom from this hadith that um, it is from the bounty of Allah that whatever we obtain that is good, it's from Him. Okay. So we should also wish the same bounty and whatever Allah subhanahu has blessed us with for others as well. And maybe even more. Okay. So similarly, Ibn Rajab Al-Hanbali also states that we should wish for other Muslims to be better than us in ibadah and in akhlaq. Like for example, how a teacher would want his student to exceed him in terms of what he's teaching. This is a great wish of the sincere teacher, right? To teach him to the utmost, in fact, to even elevate him above himself. On the other hand, of course, we can't forget about ourselves. You know, we should also wish for our own constant self-improvement. So we are competing with each other for good, for the khayr. So it is not sufficient to merely wish for something which is good for other Muslims while we are deficient and not striving to be better Muslims ourselves. You know, it's like we also can't be hypocritical. We have to preach what we practice, also uh, increase in our ibadah as well as we are giving the nasiha. Okay. So this is a matter of continuous competition among us to attain the khair, the good. Unfortunately, there are many Muslims in this world today who have very weak iman. Okay, except those who, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed His mercy and His rahmah upon. And many of these weak Muslims commit sins on a regular basis. They violate Islam, the haram, left and right. And in the past, these people were of the minority and the Muslim community would tend to dis disassociate themselves away from such people. Like the principle of al-bara. The reason for this again to make them realize what they're doing is wrong. And to sort of alienate them. As for example, you would do to your son, like you know, give a time out, for example, that they're isolated in their rooms. To have, make them reflect on what they've done, which is bad. Okay, But to do that in contemporary times may not be appropriate. And instead may be counterproductive. And we mentioned this before. Because now, unfortunately, the minority are the good people. The minority are the mu'minun. But the majority are the ones who are not fulfilling their the fard, the obligations. And they're engaged in major sin often, unfortunately. So even people with the minimum level of Islam should still be, we have to regard them as the brothers and sisters in Islam. So as if they were to commit a sin, we should love them to leave that sinful act. You know, we should care and love for them, that which we love for ourselves, and that they also be guided a right away from sins and disobedience, just like how we would want to be guided away from uh, ma'asiyah and disobedience. So highlights of this beautiful hadith. Okay. 
This can be practiced at many different levels. It can be applied in giving nasiha, giving sadaqah, and in joining good and forbidding evil. Okay, the Muslim world today, unfortunately, is divided in so many different ways, and division has unfortunately become the norm. But, inshallah, by practicing this beautiful and profound and powerful hadith, the seeds for brotherhood and love can be implanted within our own ummah and ourselves, and within our hearts. We can also protect ourselves from contempt, pride, kibr, suspicion, selfishness, and other evils as well. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, to guide us and give us tawfiq from this beautiful hadith, simple sentence, a simple principle, but profound. With this, inshallah, we will close. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik, wa nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant, wa sakfik wa tubu wa ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.